Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Happy Tuesday. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be exceedingly glad in it because God is good. He's worthy to be praised. Yes, he's worthy to be praised. Thank you guys so much for joining us this morning. Uh, another time of encouragement, another time where we can just, you know, dig into the things of God and find every reason to rejoice in the Lord and, and to be glad and, uh, to find every reason to trust God today, to find every reason to get some good vibes. I like what somebody just said. Yeah, some good vibes. That'll help you throughout the day. And so, ooh, I'm really, really excited. This is a great day. We're in God. He's in us. And while we might not know what this day holds, we will declare it and set this day like you set a thermostat. We set this day to be a good day. We set this, some of you who are getting ready to go to bed, to have a sweet sleep. When your head hits the pillow, it hits the pillow in peace and your sleep shall be sweet. And um, so whether you're getting ready to take your rest, you finish your day, or whether you're getting ready to start your day, it's all good. It is all good. And so, um, we, we are, we bless you today. Um, and I, I tell you, I, I got a, I got a lot to be grateful for. And, you know, when you sit back and you, you start kind of like counting your blessings and just kind of, you know, you can, you, you're at that little point where you can complain about something, but you realize I don't even want that to come out of my mouth because God's been too good. That's pretty good. And so I say grace, mercy, and peace to all of you today. And um, yeah, man, it's it's a it's a good thing. It's a good, good, good deal. And so we send blessings to you wherever you are logging in from. I mean, from all over the world is basically what I what I see every morning. And that that's pretty cool. That um you know, you get something out of this time uh, where Taffy and I can come and be as transparent as we know how to be, because we believe that it, it's important to be able to see living epistles in the gospel, not flawless epistles or flawless people, but living epistles to be able to share, you know, how far God has bought us from and what God has done. And so we send blessings to you. First of all, send blessings to Pakistan this morning. Um, we send blessings to South Carolina. We send blessings to uh, Florida. We send blessings to Shreveport, praise God. We send blessings to um, those of you in Point Ministries. God bless y'all this morning. Dayton, Ohio, we send blessings to you, praise God. And we are so grateful and so thankful for you being on here. And so we just, we just thank God for you. We thank God for you and we love you. And we are just, we're just grateful. We're praying for people who, you know, you probably know somebody who just, you know, hateful, bullying, slanderous, just mean commenting. And eh, you pray for them. We pray God that your blessings be upon their life today. We pray for uh, you know, all of our enemies. And so I'm praying for all of you who have enemies, which is everybody. We pray for all of your enemies. We pray for those who despitefully use you. We pray for um, those who are enemies of the cross. We pray for uh, all of those. And, and we, through faith and the love that Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, poured in our heart, we release that love right now. And we pray in the name of Jesus that God Almighty will will bless even those who are against you. And so, like we talked about yesterday, mature out of, <clears throat> of those situations. We send blessings to Zimbabwe this morning, uh, Palm Spring, California. We send blessings to your way. To the Philippines, we send blessings your way. And 
I heard somebody say this one time, uh, send blessings to your haters. What? Yeah. Send blessings to your haters. And so, you know, take the time out and, and just make your mind up. I'm just, I'm going to, I'm going to just going to be, I'm going to chill in Jesus today. I'm going to find peace and calm and ease in knowing Jesus and knowing that Jesus loves me, knowing that, um, you know, he's with me, he's got my back. And that's why I continue to say that the word I believe for us to mature in is the word called intimacy. Uh, that, that, that's, I believe is just, just the thing we got to do. We've got to learn how to, you know, have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, because I don't think anything else you can do. You can learn everything in the Bible. You can learn all the principles you can all that, but there's a level of intimacy that you get by knowing Jesus Christ, um, that really outweighs everything. Uh, and that's, that's the difference between you know, religion, self-effort, um, rules and regulations that you try to keep. Uh, it's, it's that intimate relationship with God. And God begins to lead you and guide you. He begins to show you things. He begins to show you things about yourself. He begins to show you things about him. And you establish this wonderful, intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, dwell on that word this Tuesday, all day today intimacy yeah, allow god to come into you and see i mean he already knows everything about you because the bible says he weighs our hearts but um uh, that's a that's a word that keeps coming up in my spirit it's where where i begin to see my life genuinely begin to change is when i took a, the intimate relationship with god seriously and it's that intimacy with god in my prayer time the intimacy with god when I study, even the intimacy with God, like when I'm in a car I'm driving home by myself, I'm just like talking to God, like, Lord, what do you think about this? Or, or, you know, what's awesome is sometimes he starts the conversation. Son, what do you think about this? Or son, I want to talk to you about, you know, this conversation you had today, or I want to talk to you about your attitude. That's, that's awesome. That's awesome that God can just show up and start talking to you about stuff that you haven't even put in the words that's an intimate relationship and he's always concerned about doing you good and making you happy so god's not a god that's trying to condemn you he says i i didn't come into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved pastor rick Layden, god bless you sir love you um and i'm just i'm just grateful for that time of intimacy that time of getting up and knowing him uh knowing that you're delivered from performance you're delivered from um you know, trying to impress or the need to impress you're delivered from trying to be validated by other people. It's 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 whenever things feel weird, that's when you dive into that intimate relationship with him and you have a fellowship and a talk with him. And he just kind of makes all of that stuff around you shrink. It seems so small. He takes a gigantic issue and turn it into a little pebble. And that's the purpose of an intimate relationship with God not out to try to prove how important you are or not out trying to prove, you know, that you hang out with the big boys. Um, it's, it's just all about him. It's just all about him. It's, it's like you, you, you hurt less, you're offended less, um, when you have that intimate relationship with God, because it's out of a heart of intimacy and affection that you do what you do for God. It's not out of, um, fear, condemnation, obligation. You do it out of your heart. And I I just, I, I mean, I know God and, and you know him and, and you know, that's, that's how he would have it. He wants us to do what we do because we want to do what we do for him. And I think, you know, you know, when, when people are having to do something for God, but they're not doing it from a willing mind and a willing heart, um, I, I, I just don't, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know about that. It's like, no, I want to do what I do for God uh, out of a willing heart. Intimacy. That's the word. I want to do what I do for God. And so think about that. Or have you gotten caught up into the rat race of trying to keep up with the Christian Joneses at church or, 
Or do you do what you do? Because it's like, this is between me and God. I'm not trying to do this for attention. I'm not trying to do this for an award. I'm not trying to do this for somebody to pat me on the back. I know him. I love him. I want to be with him. I want to talk with him. I want to please him. I want to walk right before him. Yeah, man. It, it's like, okay, so, you know, somebody says, well, how do you start that? It's real simple, man. Get somewhere quiet and start off by talking to God like you would talk to somebody that's on the earth and, you know, not quite, but you know what I mean, you know, and go to God and like, commit yourself to him to say, Lord, I, I I need you. I mean, that's a great way to start. I mean, you know how big it is when a person finally comes to the end of themselves and they realize that all of the stuff they've done, all of the, um, you know, uh, self-help stuff that they tried and they finally go to God and say, I, I don't want to do nothing without you. I, I'm, I need you. Help me, Lord. Man, that's a powerful, powerful thing. And what becomes so convincing is when he helps you, you'll never forget. I asked the Lord to help me and he did. And things turned out to be better. I asked the Lord to help me and he showed up. I know that there's no other explanation for why things appear to be better than the fact that I decided to step away from the rat race of needing validation from other people or trying to show people how spiritual I was. And I just decided to just go before God and say, hey, Lord, I need you. And then he shows up and now you got this one-on-one -on -one for sure relationship with God. Um, Man, that's, that's pretty strong. And that's what I'm really trying to get people to see that God is not this tyrant sitting on the throne, threatening you that if you don't do this or do that, I'm going to get you. That's not what it is. About, about the time the Holy Spirit finishes with us, dude, he's going to be working in us desires to want to do what pleases him. And that's what this is about, man. I, that's why I'm, I'm really at peace. I'm, I, all I can do is share with you. All I can do is teach you the word. All I can do is do that. I can't make you do none because you're a free moral agent. And, um, you know, I used to want people to want God more than they wanted God. Um, and I realized, man, I can't want it more than a than than an individual. You got to want it for yourself. And, um, you know, I used to spend like three, four o'clock in the morning trying to convince somebody to, to go with God. And and I thought, wow. And God was like, would you stop doing that? He says, I, 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 I want you to to plant a seed and water it. I didn't tell you to do the increase. The increase is my job. It's not yours. So do what you need to do. Plant and water and I'll bring about the increase. And that's what I've been doing. I've been I've been moving into a place of peace and calm. I've been moving into that place. of peace. And I've been asking God to help me. I'm on a journey of of, of achieving peace and calm and not just um when nothing's going on. I'm talking about especially when something's going on, when I'm being dogged out, talked about, misunderstood. Uh, that's when that peace and calm uh, just shows up and, and you, 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 you immediately go into your secret place and you're like, hey, my secret place is, is my fellowship with the Lord. My secret place is my time with God. And I spend time with God and all of a sudden those other voices are no longer carrying any weight because I'm seeking the peace the, Jesus said, peace, I live, leave you, not the peace that comes from the world. So we're talking about Jesus peace. And that's that's become a very important journey in my life to achieve that calmness. And, you know, when things do happen and I find myself peaceful and calm, I'm, I'm like so happy because I'm thinking like, oh, man, I remember when, you know, several years ago, uh, if that would have happened, I'd have been all stressed out and and everybody been all worried about me. And I'm just chill, bro. I'm just like looking forward to becoming more and more at ease because I know God. I know his word. I know him. I have, I have real fellowship with him. I don't have to pretend like I know him. I don't have to, you know, quote a thousand scriptures to let you know I know him. I, I can just, um, I mean, I know him, you know him. I mean, you spend time with God, you know, you know him and he knows you. And, and that brings about an enormous amount of calmness and peace and 
and um, ease in your life. And I believe as we learn how to be there, somebody says, well, why would you want to do that? Well, I believe the highest kind of faith where this grace is concerned uh, is rest. I believe that. I believe the highest kind of faith is rest. And I believe that when we learn how to rest, when we're resting, God's working. And, you know, I'm not, uh, here's something that I'm going to make, try to make clear over the next several weeks when I preach is that when it comes to this grace of God, when it comes to what Jesus has done, we bring nothing to the table. I, I, the more and more I look at it, the more and more I'm becoming convinced that the life of grace is a, is a life of yieldedness. It, it's a life of yieldedness. Um, that's pretty cool. It's a life of yieldedness. And that doesn't mean that you're flawless. It doesn't mean that you're not going to miss the mark. Like I said, you hear me say journey. This is a journey that you go on. You know, it's 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 yielding to what Jesus has already done. It's not me trying to do something to make Jesus do it. It's recognizing that he's already done it. It is finished. So my righteousness is already finished. I'm not bringing anything to the table to finish it that my my redemption is already finished i'm not bringing something to the table to finish it uh, i i'm learning how um this is my journey i'm learning how to live a life where i am yielded and yielding to what jesus has finished and um and that is taking me to that place of rest uh, that's taking me to that place of rest. You know, you know, somebody talks about the works of God and, and the Bible. These men were following Jesus and, and they said, show us how to do the works of God. And Jesus says, you want to know how to do the works of God? Believe in the one that I sent you. In fact, he said, the only work I want you to do is to believe in the one that I sent. And, you know, I just think that we keep trying to bring something to the table. Like, like Jesus didn't mean it when he says, said it is finished. It's like, I know he said it is finished, but you know, you got to do one, two, three, four, five. No, all you need to do is receive what has already been done. You know, it is by uh, faith that you take hold of what grace has already provided. And, and, and I just, I don't know. I, I think we just think God's some little chump and he just needs, you know, us to prop him up in order for things to work. Nah. That's not how that works. And every day I live it, it's like I, I know it. I'm not, I'm not going to argue with anybody about something I already know. It's like if I give you a recipe for a chocolate cake, I'm not going to argue with you about, yeah, it really is a recipe for a chocolate cake. Uh, it really is a chocolate cake. You know, I'm not going to argue with you about it. You go in there and cook it yourself and you'll find out. I've been cooking it and I'm living in that life. And um, a Christian life is not perfect of Christian life is not flawless. It's recognizing um, who you are and who you are in Christ and trusting him to help you. And he will finish. Um, he will finish it. He'll finish you. He's committed to um, completing you and bringing you to a place where you need to be. Um, I, I think the return of the Lord is closer than we think. Uh, I do. I really do. I think the return of the Lord is closer than what we think. Um, if you look at what's going on in the world, you see earthquakes, you see fires, you see hurricanes, you see tornadoes, you see all the things I talked about earlier this year. Uh, uh, I tell you what, it's going to be an amazing time when Jesus comes. It's going to be an amazing time. See, Jesus did the work. We should rest in the work. Don't compare Jesus with you. You you know, Jesus did the work. And so we rest in that work. Let me show you how that works. It's called spiritual warfare. What is spiritual warfare? Does, does it mean fighting to try to get something Jesus has already gotten? No. Spiritual warfare is for you to maintain the victory that Jesus has already obtained. Did you get that? Spiritual warfare is maintaining victory that Jesus has already obtained. You didn't obtain the victory because you don't you can't go get righteous. You tried that. 
You tried that under the law to try to be righteous. It couldn't, it couldn't work. Jesus did what we couldn't do. He went and got the victory. So that means we already have victory and our job is to maintain it. So where healing is concerned, we're already healed because Jesus has already healed us. And so uh, we maintain that. We maintain that with the symptoms. We maintain that with the cough. We maintain that with the doctor's report. We maintain that. Um, and so we just hold on to it. I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm healed. My job is to maintain. Jesus' job was to obtain. What we've been trying to do is a job that Jesus has finished, obtain. <laughs> and uh, instead of resting and maintaining our position and what he's finished. And so we keep trying to get victory. When Jesus got the victory, our job is to maintain the victory. And we move from victory to victory to victory because it's something that's already finished. And so my job is to maintain the victory. And that's the spiritual warfare. It's Satan trying to knock you off of what you are maintaining. It's Satan trying to get you to the point where you just, he's trying his best to get you to be afraid that what God finished won't come to pass. He's trying to get you to be afraid that what God has concluded won't come to pass. And so, you know, uh, you know, you have to, I see this comment, you you have to remember that you've got to agree with the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, it's like, that's part of the manifestation coming in your life. You, you are, you have, instead of saying, I'm not healed, you've got to agree with him. I mean, you got to agree with what he did on that cross. That's what faith is. You got to agree with what has already happened on that cross. Uh, you can't be moved by what you see. You can't be moved by what you hear. You got to be moved by what he's already accomplished on that cross. That's what faith is. That's what faith is. And so, amen. See, I don't got the talking. And um, let me go ahead and at least finish giving you the stuff on the relationship. And then, you know, we can continue to, to talk. I, I, I guess I'm I guess I feel you this morning. And I guess that's what I'm, I've been praying for. Let me. Lord, get in, get on my tongue and let me speak things to people I can't see. I don't know where they are. They're all over the world. Let, let me say something that that uh, makes them think I was just right there in the house listening to what was going on and that they can receive it and that their lives can prosper today to do what needs to be done. And I, I have to trust in God when I come online with you guys. What am I going to talk about today? Uh, I mean, after doing this for over two years, what am I going to talk about today? You know, I thought, well, you know, once pandemic was over, I just kind of quit. I don't want to. I, I love this is awesome. This is amazing. Praise God. And uh, I just believe the Holy Spirit is working in you. And uh, there's just some great things going to happen. And, and I, I declare you're healed in Jesus name. I declare your 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 brokenness. Jesus died for your brokenness. So don't declare I'm broke. De but broken declare that i'm whole start declaring that i'm whole and that all is well with you right now uh and i agree with you i'm lost without jesus too for real man i'm really lost without jesus so i don't want to be without him because i don't want to be lost so I'm, I'm gonna keep him he's he's cool i love him I'm not gonna let him go nobody can talk me out of that i mean can't talk me out of jesus i already know he's real i've experienced him every day i walk with him every day I know him. He knows me. So, you see, when it's a religious game and you don't know him and there's no intimacy, somebody might be able to talk you out of it. But when you know him and and you speak to him and he speaks to you and y'all got that kind of relationship, can nobody talk you out of that? Ain't no use of them trying. You just look at him like, <laughs> yeah, whatever, man, you know, and you just go on because it's like, man, I ain't hear that. I mean, you know, I ain't rocking with that at all. Uh, amen. All right. Uh, so we talked about uh, seven actions um, to building better relationships and how to restore relationship. And the first thing we talked about was love, how love is a starting point. And it's so important because many problems in conflicted relationships um, involve power struggles and people feeling excluded and the absence of brotherly affection. So you fix these problems by expressing um the power of love. And so that's important. Where is that love? Where is that love? Number two, encouragement. I think I told you that a major problem that retards relationships is criticism. 
and positive encouragement will always, always be better than negative criticism. And then what happens is when you're so critical like that, you might you might want to ask yourself, why am I so critical? Why am I so critical? Make people feel important. Encouragement is is, is awesome. Make people feel incur in, important and encourage them. Use their name when you talk to them. Be friendly and smile. I'm not just talking about marriage relationships. I'm again, you know, I'm talking about relationships with people in general. And I believe that, like my my friend Bishop Kenny Fuller says, everything happens at the speed of relationship. Ah, remember that everything happens at the speed of relationship. You're not going to be successful trying to be a team of one. OK, everything happens at the speed of relationships. All right. Number three, respect. That's that's huge. Uh, you, If you want to recover and restore relationships, you got to be willing to respect people. Uh, when you respect somebody, it, it's due regard. You're regarding their feelings. You're regard. You're re you're regarding, you know, am I going to do something to to hurt them? I want to respect them. OK. And respect is huge. This this Wednesday night, I'm going to talk about contentment and what it means to be content. A lot of people don't really know what it means. They think contentment is just being satisfied. It's much bigger than that. And I'll teach on that tomorrow in Bible study. Number four, here's the fourth thing you can do to restore broken relationships with friends or, or relatives or um, yeah. Uh, number four, accept responsibility. Um, don't be defensive and, and play the blame game all the time. You know what I mean? Um, defensiveness, that's it's when you're defensive, that's like self-protection. That's basically what that is. Um, it, it, it's self-protection that's uh, that comes from perceived criticism. And so you feel like I need to be defensive because I perceive that you're trying to be critical of me. So um, I'm going to be defensive. I'm, I, I need to protect myself. Uh, I blame others for things that go wrong. And so what happens, um, that's going to stop good relationships from forming when you start blaming other people for things that go wrong. And so uh, it's the refusal to properly evaluate our own contribution to the conflict. that That's the problem. It's like everybody made a contribution to this. And defensiveness is a way of blaming your partner or your friend. You're saying, in effect, the problem isn't me. The problem is you. You remember how Adam did um, Eve in the garden? It was this woman you gave me, you know, and you're never going to get anywhere with that. It's like finger pointing, you know, finger pointing and fault finding only magnify the problem. It doesn't help it. Doesn't resolve it. Finger, finger pointing and fault finding only magnifies the problem. Accepting responsibilities does that mean taking all the blame for everything. I'm not saying that, but it means to sit down with an open attitude and examine the issue and to examine the part that you play. Uh, amen. And that was number four. Now, today I want to give you five and six, and I think we'll be able to accomplish that five, six and seven today. Okay. Number five. Um, I, it's like breaking the deadlock or, um, the silent treatment. <laughs> you won't communicate like you need to communicate. So when conflict in a relationship, any relationship, when conflict escalates to a certain level, people stop talking to each other. Okay. And that's not really good either. So what happens is they quit church. They move out of the house. They become uh ill humored and irritated and they avoid each other and you got to break that deadlock you, the, the silent treatment is not the answer okay uh, you've got to move from deadlock to deadlock to dialogue in any relationship you've got to move from deadlock the silent treatment to having a dialogue so this could always have the potential for more conflict Absolutely. But good people with good motives need to talk. Good people with good motives need to talk. Well, I think it's worth talking about how do you do this? Because it's painful and hurtful sometimes when you go through some stuff with in relationships. So 
I, I guess I have to say, all right, practically, how would I how would I initiate this? Number one, uh, look for common ground, not fighting ground. Where are some common ground we can start off this conversation and not fighting ground? Sometimes to maintain relationship, people must agree to disagree about a particular area of disagreement. You got to agree to disagree about a particular area of disagreement. And this this is, you know, I don't know what it is about Christians. As soon as, as, soon as we re- realize that we don't agree on certain biblical principles, we go into deadlock and then we start judging. That's that's not how you do that. That's not how you do that. Um, and then the relationship is is dissolved and, you, you know, you just kind of hide behind scripture and hide behind the church like ain't nothing happened. Learn to work around things you cannot change. I'm learning that. I'm learning to work around things I cannot change. I mean, I see that people are just stuck in a certain place in relationships. Uh, I put that in my prayer list and and uh, I just kind of work around that. And then I watch God do some amazing things in changing their lives. So the process of breaking the deadlock, it involves a dialogue. It involves talking and it involves a dialogue. Amen. All right. Let's look at number six. Ah, oh, man, I'm late. Can I keep going? I'll be through in a couple of minutes. Is, is that cool? Let me know. Let me know. If not, I'll log off right now. I had no idea. We were like kind of out of time. Can I have like five minutes? Five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, five minutes. Going once, going twice. All right. Nobody wants me going. So I guess I'll stop right now. Um. Anyway. Uh, well, one person says, yes, you can. Uh, okay. I just got two more to give you. You want me to give them to you? Ha 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 ha. It's cool. Please stay. <laughs> no, that's good. All right. Number six, manage emotions. Now emotions are feelings on the inside and God gave us those emotions, but he never wants those emotions to, uh, govern our lives. So you got to manage your emotions. And the only way I know of to manage your emotions is you got to manage what you're thinking. You know, um, first you have influences and then those influences determine how you think. And then your thinking determines how you feel. So if you're going to Im- if you're going to manage your emotions, negative emotions, you're going to have to manage what you're thinking. You're going to have to manage what you're what you're thinking. OK. Uh, and then number seven, prayer. It helps in building relationships. And you guys know what I'm saying. I mean, some things, it just seemed like this was doomed. I mean, some of you know what it feels like to be on your way to divorce court and started praying and God just canceled the whole thing. Uh, Let me say this. I saw something. Somebody says it's difficult to manage your thinking. Just because something is hard doesn't mean you don't do it. Something being difficult cannot be the excuse for you not doing it. Um, If it was easy, everybody would have some. If it was easy, everybody would have success. Uh, Being difficult, being hard should not be an excuse to not initiate what you know is necessary to get the results. I used to always tell uh, my kids that an excuse is nothing but nails used to build houses of failure. And you can make an excuse or you can make a way. And I'm sure there are some painful, hurtful things. But, um, you know, you, you've you got to to do that. You know, well, it's it's hard to get up to pray. It's hard to read the Bible. It's hard. You can do that with anything. And so you have to understand that you change the way you think by changing what you're exposing yourself to. So if it's hard to manage your thinking. It's probably just you hanging around the wrong stuff. You know, what what what's influencing you? I mean, there are some things that are influencing the, what you hear and and what you're seeing and, and what you're talking about. Those conversations you engage in, all that stuff determines the way you think. So if you want to change the way you think, you got to change those influences that you are around far too much. And then those influences that you are around far too much. Well, now, you know, you you adjust and, and start hanging around good influences. Those good influences will change the way you think. OK, so the way you think just doesn't come from nowhere. 
the way you think is a result of what you're hanging around and what you're listening to and what you're involved in. And so if the way you think is being infected, then you are hanging around something that's infecting you. And so, um, yeah, man, this is uh, this is something that's so, 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 so very important. All right. There you have it. Maybe we'll talk that in detail. So tomorrow I'm going to talk about contentment and um, start a little series on that because I, the Bible says that godliness uh, with contentment equals great gain. And I just believe that Christian people should understand contentment and what that means. Have an amazing Tuesday. I know you will. I love you guys so much. See you from the pulpit of world changers tomorrow. Have a great day. God bless you.